say, but the resolution will be posted uh, later today. But we have both resolutions for assignment three are available for the discussion. The minister is on Wednesday evening, starts at 6 30 on the Vegas Post on the Post website. Um, the material company everything up to the class on Friday and um, that includes the examples of the covering of class last time. The only thing we didn't cover in the class last time was the last two questions on that example. We'll cover that in today's class. But there's a theory behind those questions that we covered last week. So if you want to look at studying for the research of the class of class of class
you're saying, well, beta 1, we'll never be able to know what that is, but we'll be able to estimate the lower bound and an upper bound for that. And in the slides, then, we calculate that a lower bound is equal to the beta 1 we estimate from the data. We call that B1. So my estimate of beta 1 is B1 minus CT times the standard error of B1. So that's my lower bound. And it's a symmetrical confidence interval, so my upper bound then is the same thing as the plus sign. Beta B1 plus CT times standard error. So question six asks us to calculate those bounds. And what we would need then to do that is estimate CT. We help to find CT, I should say, and then estimate that error as standard error B1. So Last week, our discussion was quite extensive around that, but essentially we got to this calculation where the standard error for B1 squared, so notice the square there in slide 67, the square, so the standard error for B1 squared, that's another way of simply saying the variance of B1. That variance then includes the model standard error divided through by a term that's related to the variance talk about that denominator term there. The variance of x. The variance of my x data. Is nothing more than taking the sum of my x data points minus the average x and dividing it through by n minus 1. So if we know the variance of my raw data x, recognize that that term then here in the denominator is simply a multiple, a multiple n minus 1 of the variance of the x data. So if you know the variance of the x data, you can easily calculate that denominator without actually forming the summation over the n variance. It saves us a lot of time by simply using the, the variance that's so let me challenge you and give you three, four minutes, probably as, as much as you need to calculate that confidence interval. In the, in the last few minutes, I've essentially recapped all the important information you need to do that estimation so that you can calculate this confidence interval. Being a little bit astute, you can calculate the confidence interval value in probably 30 seconds with a shortcut technique. But take the longer route and calculate it using that formula, and then I'll show you the shortcut afterwards.
There's a small savings there, CT value is 2.26. You can always look it up, but it's 2.26. Perhaps let's begin by just looking at the shortcut method. The shortcut method is the information is actually given to us in the printout. The standard error for V1 is given on the page over there at 0.6523. So in the, in the um, modified output from the, from the software, we see that value of 0.6523 given to us. So you can just read that value the wall, multiply by the 2.26 of CT and construct the lower bound of the upper bound, which in this case then is minus 7.59, and the upper bound is minus 4.64. But far more important and interesting is to actually be able to help take that standard error for B1 yourself, because it's not a long calculation. And emphasizes that you understand what's what's going on in this problem. Standard error for B1 the formula is given up there on the board on the uh, projector. So let's start from that point and recognize what the numerator and the denominator are. So standard error for B1 squared is equal to the standard error from the model squared divided by the variance of x, or a term at least that's related to the variance of x. 
So the last time we showed what the standard error was, we calculated that in class that was 20.7, so we can sub that in. So we have 20.7 error for the last time we calculated SE. The variance then in the denominator, we're told in the question what the standard deviation of the next data are. Standard deviation, in this case, my x variable is temperature, and we're told in the question that the standard deviation of temperature is 10.0 Kelvin. So if the standard deviation is 10 Kelvin, then the variance of, of temperature is equal to 100 Kelvin squared.
Various definitions, one over n. Yeah? Okay, so there is, there will always be a little bit of ambiguity on that point. Variance is typically defined as one over n minus one. For large samples of the population, we'll say n, because then it really doesn't matter. But the true definition of variance is one over n minus one. Okay, so let's uh Okay, yeah, that was the one I think I got. The C T value computed with how many degrees of freedom? And that's my prediction for y. 
my goal with this is to find an upper bound and a lower bound within which I can stay with 95% certainty that my prediction lies within the bound. So how far up do I go? How far down do I go? Well, this equation tells me how far up and down to do. It says take your xi value, subtract the average x from when you build the model. So average x is going to be here, for example, and this is going to be the corresponding average y. Remember, a regression model always passes exactly through x bar y bar. This denominator is this variance term we've just discussed in the example prior to that. N is the number of data points you use to construct your model. Standard error is the variance of the residuals. So what this says is very expected and very intuitive. Firstly, it says that the further and further your U value of x is away from the mean, the larger this term is going to become. Notice that every term in the bracket is positive. Numerator is positive, denominator is positive, positive, positive. This can only get bigger and bigger. In fact, the minimum value that this entire term up there can take is when your new x is x bar. That's the smallest value you can ever have. The moment xi deviates from x bar, you get the quadratic curvature starting to form. And so the best way to illustrate that is as follows. That's what those, what that equation up there says. Deviate from x bar. At x bar, this is the smallest deviation you can ever have. After that, it simply grows quadratically. Above and below. Whereas the previous one, I told you you could use plus or minus four times the standard deviations. What that does is, it's actually lying to you a little bit, but it's a pretty good lie because it's close enough to be truthful. Those four times standard deviation correspond roughly to this, if I have to estimate it. Okay. So the yellow curves I've just drawn, those are parallel to your regression line. Okay, those would be the of the dash line we consider. But those are parallel, which tell you your error is the same no matter where you are. And we know that that's not true. We have an intuitive understanding that if you build your least squared model in the range from 4 to 16, you can't really go use your model with x equals 50 and expect your prediction error to still be plus or minus two standard errors. Okay. The further away you are from where you built your model, the worse your predictions must be. We have that intuitive expectation. This plus or minus two times standard error rule works well, provided you're within the range of where you built your model. After that, we recognize that we really should have quadratic effects that kick in. So these red lines then are representing the true prediction errors. They show that our error gets worse and worse. These bounds get wider and wider as we deviate from the model set. The yellow lines are parallel and are a good enough approximation. So use the yellow lines when you're comfortable and you know you're close to your normal set. Otherwise, you should use this more accurate version up here. Now, once again, let me just talk about why standard error is a great, great way to judge a model's performance. And that's if you have a model with a small standard error, it's telling you your prediction error for y is small as well. So again, intuitively, you get that expectation. A good model is a model with low standard error because that model will have a small prediction error for y. Here's an illustration that doesn't quite do it justice to illustrate this curvature. Um, only barely noticeable here in the plot. Whereas what I have here on the slide on the blackboard is too much of an exaggeration. It's not quite that accurate, but I can overlay the size of it. Okay, so 
our next goal with the next few slides is to investigate some of those assumptions with these squares models. We had made several restrictive assumptions last time, and I would like to just point out to you how you can investigate those assumptions. One is we said we assume our residuals are normally distributed, and we can easily check that if the QQ plot. The reason why that's an important assumption is when we say the variance are normally distributed, or the residuals are normally distributed, recognize that the standard error is what that's referring to. Standard error then of the residuals is related to that spread or the standard deviation of residuals. And if that is residuals in fact are not normally distributed, SE is going to be overestimated. The moment SE is overestimated, everything else starts to fall apart. Your confidence intervals fall apart, your y hat prediction errors fall apart. Okay, so checking the residuals of normally distributed is probably the single most important check you can go do after building the squares model. If there's nothing else to do, at least simply check the residuals are normally distributed so that you can see how you should interpret standard error. Now, you have to go plot a QQ plot. You cannot go simply look at the histogram of the data to figure that out. But I've already proven to you in a previous class that our eye is not very good at picking up lack of normal distribution. What you should go do, let's say you've discovered that you have non-normally distributed residuals, you should go either remove those outliers that cause the problem, or you should go transform the y variable. Those are the first two things you should go do. And then thirdly, you'll see this in a later class, you should go add other variables that will try to explain the effect of the outliers. I'll talk about that again. Let's take a look at an example to see some of that. Here is a regression model that tries to predict the price of a car, of a used car, based on the number of kilometers on, on the car. So the mileage of the car is used as my input variable, the output variable is the price of that used car. And we expect that the expected relationship that the more kilometers on the car, the lower the price when you sell it second hand. But when we take a very, very large data set, now uh, how many points we have in this data set, there are well over 10,000. There's a database of used car prices online that you can find and predict the price. And what happens when you do that simple regression model with one variable, so the variable is mileage on the car, there's my slope coefficient telling me the expected result. For every additional kilometer on the car, we expect on average, a decrease of $0.173 in sales price. So every additional kilometer on the car is going to reduce the sales price by 17 cents, is what that expectation is. And there's a confidence interval for it, does not span zero, so it is significant. And there's the model standard error. But when we go plot the residuals, we see that they're very clearly non normally distributed. It is. 95% balance, but there's a very heavy tail on the east side. And if we investigate particularly that tail, we notice that it's all related to catalyte convertibles in the data set. These are cars which do not follow the regular trend of the data set, as would be expected, because you would start to imagine that for catalyte convertibles, mileage is not the only phenomenon judging its used price. So these outliers are not well explained by the model. And they're causing your standard error to be artificially inflated. So go remove those 10 or part of data points from the model, rebuild the regression model, and we end up with what's shown on the left on the right hand side. This model now has a revised standard error and a revised slope coefficient, indicating a loss of about 15 and a half cents per kilometer. No, it's not the end of it, right? There's clearly this tail that needs to be dealt with. I'll show you some other ways we can deal with this. And we'll start to see here, these squares models are not a one-shot operation. You build one the first time, find problems, exclude those problems, for example, in the Cadillacs, rebuild your model, find other problems, deal with that problem, rebuild the model. You'll often have four or five of those at least before you land the super model. No difference to your lab. 
all the same progressions we've done before. Uh, C1 Yes, we want our So how many videos are Okay, this is certainly less significant than this, this bottom tail. So now we're saying there's a whole group of cars in here at the low end of the price market. Because this, remember this is the, the residual, these are the data points that are under predicted by 10,000. So you're predicting the sales price too low by $10,000. What is it about those cars that needs to be taken into account? So three things you can do when you discover non-normality. Remove the outlying observations. We've done that with the catalogs. Transform the Y variable. That's what we're going to look at next. Right? The transformation of the Y variable that improves the model. Or you've omitted some terms. Maybe you don't need just the price of the car and the mileage of the car. Then you probably also need a variable to say how many doors the car has. A two door or a four door car. What's the age of the car might be another explanatory variable. So you start to add an additional variable to the model. The model will improve. Standard error will go down. Prediction performance improves. So three things to do in order to detect non normality. Any questions on that so far? Okay, so let's take a look then at. Transformations and what we mean by transformations. Here, here's a different data set. And the reason why I'm choosing a different data set and not continuing with this previous one is because I'd like to show aspects of just a single problem occurring. Here we've got a problem where we've got a very slight non normality, okay, very, very minor, and there in the center, in fact, there's a whole class of points that are outside the 95%. What we can do there is, we, I would honestly almost, this is almost stop at this point, but the very straightforward thing to try, you only see very moderate non normality errors, is to apply simple transformations. So take a square root transformation of your y variable. So then what you predict is then is you take the square root of your y column and then you use that as your y variable. Rather than the original y data, take the square root of it first. And I'll show you, and on the course website, I'll show you the code, how you can do that in R without actually doing all that work. You can tell R to do this for you automatically. Let's take that square root transformation. But we'll go through the mechanics at a later time, but here we see after we've done that, the residuals now are far more than the So what I would just like to point out is that we have this concept of successive transformations where if you take your variable, either the x variable or the y variable, but let's just take the y for now. The y variable by itself is, is obviously y raised to the power of 1. I could take y raised to the power of 0.5. I could take y raised to the power of minus 0.5. I could take y to the minus 1, y to the minus 2, minus 3 and so on. And clearly as the, I go more and more negative, I'm taking a more aggressive transformation of the variable. I could also go the other way. I could go start at 1, but I could go y squared, y cubed, and so on. I can go what we call up the power, up the ladder of powers, or I could go down the ladder of powers. One transformation I do want to point out is the the log transformation because it's so prevalent in engineering. The log transformation corresponds in terms of severity of action to y to the zero. And y to the zero is obviously not defined. You get one if you do that. But in terms of the severity, what I'm saying, a log transformation is somewhere between taking a square root transformation to the point y and somewhere between taking the negative point five. In other words, the inverse square root transformation in terms of the severity. So logs occur frequently. We must understand where they fit into the scale of transformation severity. Taking squares and inverse squares is an extremely severe transformation. Taking numbers that are between plus and minus point, plus and minus two, then get to sort of the range where you'll typically. And 
it's very, very guess and check. You guess the transformation, apply it, check your residuals. Too severe or not severe enough, move up the ladder and get to take more and more severe <coughs> successively until these fall within the bounds. Another transformation that, uh, or another problem that will occur with these squares models is that of non constant error variance. I said last time that there's this assumption that our variance in Y is constant throughout the model. What I meant by that is uh, this picture is on an earlier slide. I'll just reproduce it here for you. Recall we understood this picture to mean that as we go from higher and higher values of X, then this distribution of my Y variable stays the same no matter where I am along that regression line. So one way to judge this non-constant error variance is to plot the predicted value of Y in other words, what is that red line, my predicted value of y, against the residuals themselves? And if you see, notice there's a fan shaped here in the next page in that plot. The plot spreads out, indicating that there's non constant variance. I don't want to emphasize this one too much because fortunately, these squares is pretty robust when we violate this assumption. Those, your estimates for these squares model are not significant. If this assumption is right. So we don't actually check for it very often. But if you would like to check for it, plot your predicted values of y against your residuals, and you're looking for any spread out in the fact shape. Then perhaps the final and most serious violation that we can see in our data is that of lack of Lack of independence occurs to a large extent in engineering data because we sample our processes so fast with modern instruments. We have a real luxury with our instrumentation today that we can take very rapid samples on the process. And so if we do that, we sample our variable very rapidly in time. If you plot time order in which you acquire your data, so this is different now. Notice this is not the order of your x variables necessarily. You may have to go reorder your x data to be sorted from the earliest applied x variable to the last applied x variable. And plot the data in that order against the residuals. So this is simply takes the first data point to the residuals, second data point to the residuals. And that curve should show no structure. You should not be able to see any pattern in this curve. And this is why it's a good curve to check, because our human eye is exceedingly adept at picking out structure in any curve, any residual part. You will very quickly pick up that there is some structure in there, and particularly you'll notice this, these slow moving trains. Okay. If you can't pick up any pattern in the data, then you can say that there is no violation. If you can pick up the pattern of the data set, then you know that it's a problem. So one way to judge this from a sound statistical point and not rely on your eye, because you start to notice in this course that our eye misleads us, but a way we can, not, we can do this is we plot what's called an autocorrelation plot. So I'd like to just spend the rest of the class talking about how to read this plot and what action to take on it. So let's recognize that a process that is moving slowly often has this following relationship. So an engineering system that, that moves slowly, a good example of that is the temperature in this room. If I measure the temperature in this room at one minute intervals, I'm going to see a very slow moving trend. For example, I'm going to see the temperature maybe at 22, you see it rise as people move into the room and then drop off maybe as the sun sets and then overnight it will go a little bit lower and then in the morning rise again. So if I sample this data really fast, there's a strong relationship between the variable value at one moment in time relative to the variable value one time step in the 
the parts. And the way we can express that mathematically is that x at one time step into the future is equal to the current value of that variable times a value called theta, phi, yeah, as you say, plus some small amount of noise, some error. So the variable value at the current time step multiplied by this parameter by phi is going to, plus an error is going to give me my value one step ahead. This is in fact a great model to predict the future one step ahead. I've been doing a lot of work with, uh, with some companies and we get very powerful predictions from this model. We'll talk a bit about it coming up near the end of this course, but I'd like to just point out that this model has a really interesting structure. And that is, if you plot xk against xk plus 1, so take a data set and take the current value of the data set on your x-axis and plot the next value in the data set as on the y-axis. It takes a little bit to wrap your mind around that concept. But if you notice a positive trend or a negative trend in that data set, that's indicating that you've got a correlation. Autocorrelation is what we say. So take this temperature data set. If I'm low at one point in time, I'm going to be low at the next point in time. So low values currently predict low values in the future. So you're making a one step in prediction. And essentially, the more correlated this relationship, the stronger the autocorrelation is. And that's exactly what this plot shows. This plot here tells me how strong that relationship is. And particularly what it's doing is that Let's, let's forget the first spike. Let's only focus on the second spike. The second spike is telling me what is the R, R value, so the relationship between the correlation coefficients, so take the R squared value, square root of it. What is that R value if I plot xk versus xk plus 1? Okay, and if that's a very high correlated value, that spike at lag 1 is going to be a number close to 1. Then it says repeat this exercise and now simply go change xk plus 1 to xk plus 2. So now predict two steps into the future. So what I'm doing is on this curve is I'm taking this value and I'm not predicting one step into the future, I'm in fact predicting two steps into the future. And you should expect your correlation to deteriorate. Right? It's, it's a lot harder to predict two steps into the future than it is to predict one step into the future. So this correlation will have a little bit more scattered to it, and this R squared value will go down. Then we're going to repeat the exercise and predict three steps into the future. This curve will show more spread, and your R squared will drop once again. Every time we predict a step further into the future, all that lag. So in this process, it's very slow moving. I can predict up to about 16 steps into the future with fairly good correlation. Now this process over here, I can only predict one step into the future. After that, the correlations are just enormous. Now this final plot that looks like this, I can actually predict one step into the future that it has a negative R squared, indicating the two variables are negatively correlated. And we see that because if we were high one time, then we're low, the next time, then we're high, then we're low, then we're high, then we're low. So I'll end over there and then take this up next time and show you how to keep this in R.